Again, here's a content warning for a lot of the gross, gross horrifying stuff, such as fecal fetishes and sexual assault. So don't say I didn't warn you out of the gate here. Uh, like with all the other episodes, it's kind of gross all the way through. I do want to mention that I, uh, I have a Patreon. If you'd like, go and subscribe. Got a lot more content that I'm working on, a lot more stuff that I'm, you know, researching and working on. So if you want to support that, please either go to the Patreon page down below or that little channel join icon. Does the same thing for you. But you'll both get access to it early. With that, let's continue. The first point I want to kind of bring up, and you can skip to this time code if you just want to skip this scene. I want to talk about how the series has kind of made me feel as I've been working on it. I just kind of want to make it public record, so if you don't want to hear me ramble about my mental health and content creation as a whole, uh, just skip here. Now, I am not the most famous person on YouTube, not by a long shot. The fact that I've actually passed 10k uh, subs is amazing, and I'm always grateful for the fans that I have. Honestly, sometimes creating content can be really stressful as hell. And over the last eight months, it's kind of been harder on my mental health. And if I'm being honest, Nick Bates almost kind of broke me. I guess it's kind of like staring into that little abyss, and it affected me. Knowing what happened to his stepsister and all that, and just how brazen he was about it, really affected me. So I'm currently taking steps to improve my mental health, and I'm currently on Zoloft. It's made me feel a lot better, actually. But I feel like once this series is finished, uh, a weight will be lifted off of me that I really just cannot wait to get rid of. Uh, I've been working on this series for a while now, over three months. I'm trying to find a way to structure each one of them that makes sense and doesn't tax me completely. Uh, has been very hard to do, especially the last thing we're doing here. With that, let's get on to the video. So Nick, as a human being, is incredibly detestable and incredibly degenerate. Uh, there are standards that uh, a good majority of us don't cross, even some of the more disgusting people in humanity would not cross. However, Nick doesn't just cross that little bar, he fucking shattered it. In 2013, Nicholas Strautzenberger had taken a psychological evaluation, and it somehow leaked later on in his life, and was spread out throughout the internet on pastement. Uh, I'm not well versed on psychic evaluation or psychological topics, I asked a friend of mine, uh, Aiden Paladin, a couple questions, but other than that, I, again... I am not, not a psychologist, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a lot of things, but I want you to take everything that is listed in this article, that this is what they have researched, but what I'm, my points that I'm bringing might not be fully researched, so I'd like you to be at least a little even with me on that. Several attempts were made to reach his mother, Carol, to obtain developmental and collateral information. His mother could not be reached directly, but she did leave a message reporting that he had always been a problem. His aunt, Joyce, did not recall any problems during his mother's pregnancy or his delivery. She did not recall that he had any developmental delays and commented that he was always pretty smart. There was no indication that Nick had ever received any early intervention services. By his own report, he was able to read prior to entering kindergarten. According to his mom, Nick had always been a problem child, as noted later in the evaluation. You can tell his mother's either so fed up with Nick at this point that she's just distancing herself from him, or that she might be trying to ignore his problems, both of which aren't healthy ways to live, but they're what I'm seeing from her comments here. Uh, his aunt seemed, well, said that Nick seemed pretty smart, and it seems like Nick was as a child. But as he got older, it seems that he kind of started to slip into something of a Deep psychosis? Something that I can't possibly begin to either explain or comprehend, but that's for medical professionals to do. Nick had attended Penn Manor School District, and paperwork from this district indicated that he was placed in full-time emotional support in the fourth grade. Although a copy of his psych educational evaluation is not available for review, he continues to exhibit difficulty with peer relationships, which is demonstrated by his inappropriate behaviors to peers. Until recently, Nick did not interact with his own playground and often chose to remain in his classroom during recess. He is unable to accept consequence for his actions, and repeatedly states that he didn't do anything. So even at a young age, Nick would not understand how inappropriate actions would lead to consequences. Uh, something that as he got older, he would not realize either. <laughs> and that would lead to the outcome that we all know now. It's heartbreaking, but it shows that he's truly been this way all his life. Nick was homeschooled during his 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th grade years. When Nick returned to public high school, he was enrolled in full-time emotional support. Observations indicated that his teachers described Nick as quiet, intelligent, and funny. In class, Nick will sit quietly and rarely offer answers or participate in class discussions without prompting. It's also noted that Nick needs to improve his social skills. Nick avoids high social areas such as cafeterias and hallways, even with peer prompting to join. Nick sometimes makes comments or act in ways that has a tendency to draw negative attention to himself. 
such as sucking on his hair or moaning for no apparent reason. It's interesting that Nick, coming back from being homeschooled for four years, was described as being intelligent. But it's also not shocking that Nick would avoid high social areas. As someone who was homeschooled the majority of his life, it took a long time for me to grow into my skin and stop being afraid of large crowds. I still get that kind of that nervousness even pre-COVID, but I think it's easy to describe as someone who was homeschooled. You don't have social skills at first, and it takes a very long time for you to get those, to, to you know, kind of grasp social skills. He continues to have frequent contact with a young woman, Jessa, and Jessa's fiancé, William. Nick refers to Jessa as his mother, but reported that he does not really like William, but maintains contact with him because of Jessa. Reportedly, Jessa is his age. He commented how he'd gotten her some coupons for Mother's Day. There is another individual, Thom, who Nick met online and Nick refers to as his father. If you're probably wondering why I didn't bring up Jessa or William or other friends of Nick, uh, they either don't have much of a form of public-facing content, or if they did have a public, wasn't relevant to the story we were telling here. There are things that I had to purposely cut out because they would just make the series longer for no reason at all, and I wanted to bring up that they exist here for those who might bring up that I didn't talk about them. If I end up finding more content about them, I might do a follow-up video, but that's just... that's a... That's a thing. With regard to intimate relationships, Nick reported that he has never had a girlfriend he's met in person. Nick has never been sexually active with a female or male, and reports that he regards himself as heterosexual. He reports that he has cross-dressed since he was a teen, but does not currently have access to one's clothes. He reported that he frequently masturbates and he feels his sex drive is more active than most people. He enjoys pornography that involves feces, and he reported that he frequently fantasized about having anal sex consensually and forcibly with females. He also reported that his sexual fantasies include young girls who can talk in full sentences and are house-trained, but not yet like real women. He denied that he's ever approached or had any sexual contact with a minor. He admitted that he tried to find female child pornography online in the past, but was reportedly unsuccessful. When the evaluator told him this type of activity was illegal, he indicated that he did not understand why it would be. It, it was blatantly obvious that Nick was hypersexual and his fetishes were already clearly dark and disturbing, and only got worse as he got older. Uh, even if you haven't read this report, you'd be able to tell that just from Twitter and other platforms. It's really sad this report didn't make his family take his mental health seriously and try to get him help. The transition planning indicated that Nick's future goal was to be a house husband, and Nick has given little thought to other options, even with prompting from teachers and the job trainer. And there it's evident, Nick is clearly delusional about how life worked, and thought that he would actually become a house husband, and never have to work. It's it's incredibly unrealistic and unreasonable to do without being in a stable relationship and planning beforehand. Nick didn't even want to look into real work, as stated again in that Skype call. They're gonna use this information against you, Nick. You do realize this. How, how on earth could this possibly be used against me when I'm not going to have a job? How do you or... know you're not going to want to get a job? You, you, someday you might change your mind. Uh, People are going to look at this, and they're going no, to call the cops. No. <sighs> No, son, I do not. Nick is not involved in any community activities and reportedly only leaves his apartment to go to appointments and the grocery shop two times monthly. He spends the majority of his time home alone communicating with the above individuals electronically. Nick reported he does not recall engaging in any community or school activities. And there it's evident, Nick was very isolated. He didn't want to work, he didn't want to leave his house to socialize. Something that can take a mental illness and exacerbate it. And with the way Nick lived, it's very evident that it was exacerbated to a point that, eventually, he broke. Nick received inpatient psychiatric treatment at age 15 for 11 days at Brook Glen Behavioral Hospital. He was voluntarily committed after he became physically aggressive with his own mother. A discharge summary from this facility indicated the following diagnosis. Major depression, social phobia, avoidant personality traits. Psychological testing was completed which supports the above diagnosis. It did not support psychosis. During his hospitalization, antidepressant medication was recommended, but Mother did not indicate she would follow through with his option for aftercare. Nick reported that his mother does not believe in mental illness, and therefore, she did not indicate or support treatment. One of the big questions from this story for me is, could Nick have been saved from all the shit he did, everything that happened, you know, all the shit that basically he did cause, but could all of that have been prevented if his family had taken his mental health seriously? I think possibly. You know, just maybe he could have been. But it's also a big problem with our society as a whole. And Nick's mom saying here that she doesn't believe in mental illness is very worrying. Sadly, throughout all that happened, I really hope she does understand now how mental illness can be pervasive uh, as a whole when it comes to family dynamics. It's sad that she had to learn this way, but I, I do hope that she figured that out. 
Nick did not exhibit any overt indications of an underlying thought disturbance, in the form of auditory or visual hallucinations, and he denied the presence of both in the present and the past. He denied present suicidal ideation. He reported that he has experienced suicidal thoughts in the past, quote, but I would never do it. Nick reported that he constantly has homicidal ideation towards his mother, stepfather, and aunt. However, he stated adamantly that he has no intent to act on these actions because, quote unquote, I do not want to go to jail. He indicated that he frequently has videos playing in his mind that involve killing his family in multiple ways, indicating that sometimes he's portrayed as a superhero in these videos. Nick reported that he has been violent with his mother in the past and has left bruises on her. While Nick's cognitive achievement and higher level executive functioning abilities are impressive, his emotional and behavioral functioning is concerning. In the clinical interview, Nick reported that he has videos playing in his head where he's able to view himself killing his mother, stepfather, and aunt in various ways. He reported that at times it is him in his natural state killing them, and other times he becomes a superhero with superpowers and kills them. Nick casually described how he feels they deserve to die because they are conservative and not tolerant of other races and homosexuals. He stated that they don't like him because he likes sex, violence, and cursing. Nick has clearly stated that he has no intent to kill his family because I don't want to go to jail. But he further stated that if no laws prohibited murder, he is sure he would do it. So yeah, this is incredibly incredibly fucked up, and it proves to me that Nick really shouldn't ever be released. Nick was imagining killing most of his family over and over again for years before being jailed, and I can only imagine that these videos have only gotten worse since he's been in prison. And that'd probably include Anna and a stepsister because of how they've slighted him. And him seeing himself as a fucking superhero during these killings is truly horrific to me when you look at it in hindsight. His insight was fair as he indicated that he has pursued therapy, psychiatric treatment, and psychological testing because I want to know what's wrong with me, quote-unquote. He did state that he has some concerns about decreasing his social anxiety because, quote-unquote, if I'm cured and go out, I fear what I could do. That's where I start to have the kind of sympathy I brought up earlier when it comes to his mental health. I believe that if his mental health was taken seriously, especially when, you know, he was originally first, you know, put into health care, if he had got on, you know, some sort of mental illness medication, I, I don't know. I don't know if it would have turned out better, but I can only imagine it wouldn't turn out as bad as what happened. Now let's switch to Anna. As far as I can tell, Anna is doing fine enough. Nick, thankfully, is behind bars. And seemingly, as far as I could gather from various posts on Kiwi Farms, I, I don't think that he has any chance to easily contact her. I, I do feel like we should read some of that story that I kind of teased in the last video, but I saved up until now. From the psych eval, Nick does not have any peer relationships in the community. He has a strained relationship with his family members. He developed a relationship with some individuals online when he was a teenager. One individual is Anna, and she has blocked all contact with him. Although he continues to make contact attempts to contact her electronically, Nick firmly believes that he and Anna will eventually marry, and he continues to ignore her request to not contact her, and the more recent request of the police to stop all contact with her. He believes that she resides in California, but has stated he has no plans to go to California to find her, because I would need an escort because I don't know how to go about getting there. He also reported that he'll continue to try to contact her, although I wouldn't commit a major crime to reach her, but probably a misdemeanor. He was so desperate to attempt to get Anna to love him that he was going to commit even a small crime. A small crime. And the fact that he was genuinely thinking about that is horrifying. You know, I, I just don't, I don't get it. I don't, I don't get his process. Now, I had a few tweets that I left over kind of as a uh, little bit of uh, a kind of balance of a middle to lighten everything up. So here's going to be some of the tweets that uh, some other people have recorded, because why not? Porno idea. Paul Smokey and the Fanny Bandit. <laughs> Well, so I'm catching up on my shows and uh, Family Guy is just a bit close to home with Quagmire beginning arrested for statutory rape. Now, before we finish off this story, I kind of want to talk about some more of my thought process behind this series, uh, all three episodes. Uh, I wanted to show everyone the two sides of Nick that I saw. Nick is still in my mind both incredibly funny to laugh at and a horrific monster that you would see on a TV show or a movie would get caught in the final act before he committed the crime. But sadly, those, you know, shows and film are fiction, and rarely do happy endings actually happen when it comes to stories like this. And stories like Amber's aren't anything either new or any less tragic. Children, both boys and girls, are abused every single day, and not to downplay what happened to Amber or any of the victims, they're all unwarranted. There's no such thing as a consenting fucking child. Sadly, there are people trying to start a modern-day movement to pretend that children can consent to sexual acts. Uh, I, I've covered multiple different pedophiles, but 
and it's it's indefensible. There's nothing a child offers you that you can benefit from. But these fucking these awful people on fucking Twitter have constantly gone after kids. And there was even a story I don't I haven't followed up on it lately because I haven't really checked. But uh, there was a story on Twitter about um, uh, I believe it was like a 13 or 14 year old girl who went to go uh, meet up with her map friend and had stopped tweeting for days on end. I don't know where that story went, and I, I need to look into it. But that's that's horrifying to me, the fact that people are acting in public, in the open, and they're doing this kind of shit. Nick was so fucking bold about this shit for years. And I do mean years. So a lot of people, presumably you see this shit online, you think someone's just a troll, you know, just get attention. Sad, but after Nick Bates' story, I don't think that anyone that does that for attention ever, you know, not be prosecuted, should not be at least looked into. But, sadly, that's all I got for this. We're going to continue with the story. Now, there was a Kiwi Farms user named Saul Goodman, who, uh, as far as I've been informed, has passed away since then, so may he rest in peace, who would go to some of these court cases, including Nick's court case. Uh, and he reported for everyone in the thread, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to use some of his article to read out here. Of course, because he was there, he took a video, and this video just... Mwah, amazing. It's beautiful. I'm going to play it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to just let it all play out because it's Nick walking into court. And I, I feel so smug watching him walk in. Let's continue with that. Before this, also, he made a video reading um, one of Nick's uh, fan pieces, which we're going to use to lighten up the mood a little bit more before we get into dark shit, uh, called Anna's Anal Activation. And it is some of the funniest shit, again, that I've ever seen or heard on YouTube. The Nick was miserable. He slash she's been in love with Anna for nearly ten years, but has yet to obtain reciprocation. And six years ago, she began hating him slash her, and ended their friendship for some unknown reason. The two haven't spoken since. Unexpectedly, there was a knock at the front door. The Nick ignored this as he slash she has debilitating social anxiety, and won't answer the door unless it is someone he slash she knows, in which case they'd yell who they are. The Nick stopped typing so that the person outside wouldn't hear that someone was home, and they'd leave. But a familiar voice called, Nick, it's Anna. The Nick's heart began racing. He slash she rushed to the door and opened it, indeed revealing the love of his slash her life. But before we, before we get into Saul's reading the case, I want to talk a little more about Amber and her story. Three years before his arrest, in his psych eval, this came up. He reported that his mother and stepfather will not allow him to come to their house, although Nick has reported that he does not know what prompted that decision. When he inquired about this to his stepfather, Nick indicated that his stepfather said, You know what? Meaning that his father must have had some sense to what was happening. Nick had taken advantage of his half-sister Amber to do depraved and horrifying sexual acts and abuse her from the ages of 5 to 7 years old when he had forced her to give blowjobs. Here's another quote from the evaluation. Nick does have a 10-year-old maternal stepsister, and he reported that he has a good relationship with her, but he is not allowed to see her without a parent present. He has denied any past violence or inappropriate behavior towards her. I, I believe it had gone on probably longer. It's horrifying to think about, because you don't want to think about that. You don't want to think about a child being abused, and rightfully so. Amber had almost certainly went through a lot. One of the things that caused him to eventually go to jail was the fact that her nether regions, she kind of stopped maintaining hygiene there. 
And if you know anybody who has been abused as a child, that is a common attempt to deter the people who are abusing said child to get them to stop. They think they make themselves ugly or dirty, that it will stop, and sadly, it's usually not the case. Amber had to suffer through a lot, including the court case. And I think now it's time to talk about Saw's description of the court case. Saw had wrote up a large article... It's a great post, but I trimmed it down enough to where I'm not reading the entire thing verbatim, and I'm also kind of shortening it. So just so you're wondering, like, certain things aren't brought up, or why it's all not brought up there, or why I even left out some certain things, I recommend you go and read the post that's linked down below in the description, which will take you directly to the post and the whole write-up. The fact the hearing went the way it did tells us a lot about the defense strategy. By making the victim testify and pushing her as hard as they can, they're sending a message if they're going to go after this innocent 12-year-old girl if the case doesn't plead out. It's not an uncommon strategy, and sadly it's quite often effective. My last update left off with me sitting next to the stepdad, aunt, and bee mum, with stepdad going off to pick Amber up from her friend's house because she had suddenly been called to testify. Three adults do seem like stereotypical country folk. The father, a balding weathered man in clothes that suggested a physically strenuous occupation, seemed to be genuinely overwhelmed. He commented to me that I've never been to a place like this before. I assumed that he went to a courthouse for a criminal proceeding. The mom and aunt were genuinely kind and gentle people, not the horrible intolerant rednecks everyone seems to think. That said, she and the aunt are simple folk, and genuinely seem to have convinced themselves that Nick is innocent. The aunt remarked how the news reports have been filled with inaccuracies, and b concurred and said she had turned everything off for a few weeks and wanted to hear more positive stories on the news. The hearing itself was relatively short with only two witnesses called. The second was the detective, but all she was there to do was the usual, yep, I arrested him on these charges, she wasn't cross-examined. The victim's testimony, however, was unnerving. Almost everyone there looked as if they came from central casting. The prosecutor was a pretty and eager young brunette, seemingly fresh out of law school. The public defender was a heavy-set, ray-haired gentleman who was absolutely oozed with good old boy charm and sleeves. And as you can see from a perp walk, the constable was a total badass. The victim's direct examination was relatively straightforward. She told everyone who she was, who Nick was, and what had happened. Out of respect for her, I won't go into the details, but I will say that both the things she described were brutal and disgusting to a degree far beyond what has been previously reported, and that her testimony was both assured and utterly convincing, which made having to listen to it all the more horrible. However, even in the middle of her direct, the sleazy defense counsel started in what I consider to be inappropriate gamesmanship. He interrupted and asked Amber directly to speak up. I realize better than most, every defendant is entitled to a zealous and competent defense. I think it's a good thing, a wonderful thing even about our society. And sometimes a zealous defense means callously working to discredit an innocent 12-year-old girl but it does not mean actively doing things that serve no purpose other than intimidating her. The prosecutor, while generally excellent, unfortunately played into this a little bit, in my opinion, by asking questions that weren't necessary to make her prima facie case. Example, so when you say you sucked it, what do you mean by that? But it was on cross-examination that the defense counsel got significantly out of line. He began by making her repeat slash confirm pretty much everything she said on direct, and then kept pressing her for specificity on dates, times, and logistical details, including things such as exactly how Nick pulled her shirt up. The prosecutor objected, and her objections were sustained on three different occasions, that the defense counsel's questions constituted a fishing expedition, in which he was trying to discredit Amber and try the case on merits, rather than contest the Commonwealth's prima facie case that a crime had occurred and that Nick had committed it. Obviously, after the victim's testimony, the judge found the Commonwealth had met its prima facie burden and sent the case over to Lancaster County Court of Common Pleas for a former arraignment slash trial. So, yes, the case was pretty much open and shut. Nick had literally no chance at all. He was undeniably guilty on all counts. As everything goes, Nick is probably never going to get out of jail. He's appealed a sentence two times and failed on both tries. Now, I'm personally going to assume that he'll keep trying every couple of years either till he dies or his release in either 16 and a half to 40 years. However, he's basically living in a safe haven for sex offenders. Benner Township, the prison he's in, has a good amount of sex offenders in the prison. And it's basically a safe haven for him. If you want to learn more about these majority sex offender prisons, shockingly, the source I learned this mostly from was... Noted drunkard only used me blade when he showed up on PKA. And here's the skinny of that. There's the clip now. If you behave yourself for six months, I'll send you wherever you want to go. 
do you want to go to McNeil Island? Home. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, well, like yeah. How about uh, Vegas? Course, yeah. <laughs> and so um, they go, you can go to any medium security place that you want to go. And I'm like, all right, I want to go back to Monroe because Monroe had the, the maximum, medium, and minimum. And the lady looked at me crazy. And I'm like, why? She's like, are you sure you want to go to Monroe? And I'm like, yeah, it looks fucking amazing. There's like grass. There's recording studios and the fucking gyms. Like it's a, it's like the nicest place. It's considered the nicest prison in the state of Washington. And she's like, all right, I get. I'm like, why is she acting so weird? So then I um, go back to the cell, and all my my fucking cellmates who are like, I get back to the cell, and I'm like all happy. And so I'm like, going to Twin River, and then they said what? <laughs> and I'm like, well, no man, that's so scary. What is, what is the fucking problem with Twin Rivers, dude? And they're like, let me see your paperwork again. So I like, fucking pull up my paperwork. They read it. They're like, why the fuck would you want to go to Twin Rivers? I'm like, it's near my family. They can visit, it. and it's like the nicest. And they're like, do you know what Twin Rivers is? I'm like, no. They go, it's the sex offender treatment program. And I'm like, Ooh. what? And they go, yeah, it's eighty percent sex offender. And they have to have 20% regular inmates to keep state. And I'm like, are you fucking serious? Because normally (laughs) sex offenders don't walk around. Like, we find out you're a sex offender, dude. You've got to be gone by, you know what I mean? They don't, they don't play around. Can you say those words again? You got to be what? Gone. You got to be gone. Like, you need to be not here anymore. Like, PC up up and get the fuck out of here. We don't want, we don't want to share meals with people that are like kid fuckers. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Okay. They they don't like sex offenders in in jails, so I'm just like, okay, well, let's see what happens, dude. I get there; it's an amazing, but like, it's literally like that movie they live. He has the glasses and he sees everyone is like, you know, because like, yeah, everyone there was a fucking weirdo, and there was like, <laughs> you had to like find like a couple cool dudes that weren't sex offenders just to fucking <laughs> group up and be like, oh, I got your back, I got your back. Okay, cool, dude. These guys are weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, Nick is basically living in pedophile heaven, not being punished for the shit he did to his stepsister. And I don't really have a happy ending to this story, because everyone here didn't get a happy ending. Nick didn't get the help he probably needed to be a better person and ended up abusing a child, his own stepsister. His stepsister was abused and hid it for years and will probably deal with the aftermath of all of this her entire life. His mother didn't take Nick's health seriously, and sadly, both of them ended up paying a deep price. And Anna will live in fear of Nick getting out her entire life. I don't really have an ending that will cheer you up with this. And I'm sorry. However, I'm going to take it away to my friend Empty Hero, who wrote a song for uh, the series. I requested it from him. And then we'll get to the Patreon outro. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part of the channel. And let's just get it done. What a beautiful face of the young sister Bates that her brother Nick splattered with waste. What a beautiful dream as his pants filled with steam, his blinking brown eye shooting a stream. Hot dookie, he'd hold her down and blast her brown with sheet. And one day he will flush his last handle mush and die in jail smelling of pee. But for now, Nick is young and slathered with dung and counting all the turds that he has flung from his bung and rolled around on his stink brown wife he imagined just mighty disaster if he contracted AIDS there is corn in her teeth chewed two times at least hear her voice as it echoes 
Through his feces, stank and sweet, how the notes all bend and penetrate to she. Now, how Nick remembers you, how Nick would push his duty through your mouth to make your muscles move. That made you talk all of that poop But now he hopes police don't know His sister sleeps and shit so close With plop it dropped so long ago We don't even know its name What a beautiful face Nick's blasted with waste That is circling all around the sun when we meet up in jail, I'll begin to wail. I'll be wailing at every poopy I see. Can't believe he painted the walls with his own feces. And also his stinky smell. From his belly, his, his own lovely pool, his pool for me and for you. He dropped down that pool and rubbed it on his balls and put his balls on the walls too. We are at the Patreon outro. I just wanted to say uh, thanks to everybody who's still a patron. If you'd like, please uh, go to the link in the description or hit the little join icon because I'm going to read both of uh, my, my channel members and my patrons out separately. But again, you help provide content. You help me uh, buy stuff for the channel. So if you like for the channel to improve, so you can always go to patreon.com forward slash fuzuyt. YouTube, right there at the end, just YT. Uh, and you can be read off here on this little list. We got uh, a lot of creator rewards, and we're going to have some extra stuff coming soon. I'm going to revamp the tiers. But I would say if you want, definitely go for the $1 or the $10, because those are going to probably stay the same. Going to work on what's going on in the middle there. But with that, at our $10 tier, we have Amaret, Annie, Some Jagass, and Pumpkin Spices. At our $4.99 tier, we have Augie Burns. At our $1 tier, in no uh, particular order, we have Bizditch, Bailborn, K. Shea, Josh Boyles, Kim W., Lyra, and Charlie. And then at our channel memberships, we have Waterbender and The Weed Sum at our $1 tier, which gets you a blue name of a Discord, early access to videos, and much more. If you'd like, go take a look at both of those. Um, with that, this is the end of Nick Bates, unless I can somehow get an interview. I have been given a runaround by the Pennsylvania police, or well, Pennsylvania prison system, I should say. They've been giving me a runaround for the last few days, and I just, it's been great. It's been great trying to get in contact with that. So that's uh, probably not going to happen for a little while unless something changes. If that changes, though, I will make a video on it. Uh, coming soon, there should be a Jared Fogel. It should be up, I might probably leave it up a week early for patrons as well as channel members. Um, we're going to have more streams, more content. I just got a ring light that's coming uh, from when I'm recording this tomorrow. Um, we're going to do more face-related stuff. I'm going to get the green screen looking a little better. Uh, that way it doesn't look like shit, and you'll be able to see me properly. But with that, uh, yeah. All right. Take it easy, folks. Have a good night. I will see you next time when we make the next video, when the next video goes public, and the next stream. And the next everything. Also, follow me on Twitter. Uh, also, shout outs to everybody who read tweets and shout outs to Empty Hero for creating that song right there at the end. Mm, great work. Uh, love the boy. Go subscribe to him. He's a good dude. He's a good dude. He's a good dude. Anyways, take it easy. Have a good night. I will see you next time.